Hey guys, it's Celestia, and today we're going to be talking about a very serious issue facing the art community, which was brought to my attention by a Twitter user by the name of LuckFoxo33. I've been working on this video since they first messaged me, and I appreciate all of your patience this month as I postponed it three separate times and put other content on the back burner. I'll be back to my regular upload schedule again after this, but I wanted to make sure that I did as much research as possible given the nature of this topic, and that meant reaching out to multiple sources for interviews and waiting for their responses. I'm still not sure I'm gonna be able to do the issue justice in my coverage of it, but I can at least say that I have absolutely done my best to. That in mind, let's just get right into it because there is a lot to get into. For artists that accept commissions, PayPal has been all but a necessity for a long time, as it is the most versatile and widely used online payment system in the world, and subsequently what most artists use to get paid for their work. It's available in most countries, is easily integrated into most e-commerce platforms and even independent websites, and it's a household name that people trust. People know PayPal, almost everyone has an account, and when it comes to paying for commissions, buyers tend to feel safe and reassured with PayPal as the method, because their buyer protection policies put their minds at ease. For the artists themselves, there have always been issues. PayPal has not made it easy for digital goods to be sold with their service, and many artists faced a number of issues as a result. In the past, digital goods, referred to by PayPal as intangible goods, were not covered by PayPal's seller protection program, which meant that artists selling digital commissions could very easily be scammed by buyers taking advantage of that system and issuing chargebacks because they didn't receive their item. Because PayPal wouldn't protect the seller in this case, the artist would then be forced to have that commission refunded without their permission. As of March 2022, they now have an updated section to kind of fix this problem. They amended the original stipulation that protected goods had to be physical and shippable to now also protect goods that meet the intangible goods additional requirements, which are deliberately vague and effectively come down to, you have to prove to PayPal that you delivered what you sold. And even then, it's up to PayPal's discretion as to whether or not they want to deem it eligible and protect your rights on a case-by-case -case basis, which is hardly reassuring. And if that wasn't dubious enough, moving on to the next section of their seller protection program terms really digs in how shady they are and how little this update actually protects artists. Because under the list of ineligible items and transactions, they include anything PayPal determines in its sole discretion is prohibited by this user agreement or PayPal's acceptable use policy, even if the transaction is initially marked as eligible or partially eligible on the transaction details page. So basically, whether or not PayPal will protect artists from scammers trying to get out of paying for commissions is pretty much as impossible to determine as ever. Some artists have found a workaround by using the friends and family option for payment rather than goods and services, but doing so is technically a violation of PayPal's terms of service if it is actually for business purposes, and a large number of significant friends and family transactions, with that in mind, runs the risk of PayPal finding that suspicious and banning your account immediately. Which is a recurring theme with them, but we'll get into that. Others, myself included, have found the use of PayPal invoices to be helpful with this, as it allows you, as the seller, to have much more control over the transaction and hold your clients to your own terms of service that can protect you better than PayPal's own. But that protection is still quite limited, and it's really just a band-aid on the gaping wound that is PayPal's policies for artists. The point I'm trying to make with this background information, though, is that while PayPal has a long history of screwing artists over whenever possible, most of us have still continued to use it anyway because of the sheer convenience. But as LuckFoxo33 brought to my attention, things have gotten much, much worse. And artists everywhere are no longer facing the question of whether or not they should keep using PayPal despite those problems. They're being told that whether they want to or not, they can't. And they can't have their PayPal balance back, either. Thousands of artists around the world are getting the same email. You can't use PayPal anymore. Upon opening that email, they're told that their account has violated their acceptable use policy or has been found to be too high risk. And therefore, not only will their PayPal account be banned, but any money in their existing PayPal balance will be held for up to 180 days before they're finally able to get it back. Any attempt to get more information is met with a wall. 
PayPal's own terms mean they don't have to tell you how you violated their policies. So they absolutely never do. They will never tell you why your account was banned. And in many cases, they don't even know themselves because all evidence points to a bot being responsible for issuing the bans in the first place. Human reviews can be requested, assuming they even let you escalate the conflict with their support team. But unless you're loud and persistent enough or have a big enough following behind you, the human will uphold the initial ban and still refuse to tell you why. If you are lucky and relentless enough to get your account reinstated as a result of this process, they still won't tell you why you were banned in the first place, and you'll simply receive the vaguest possible email informing you that the ban was lifted. And what happens if you wait the 180 days? Well, for a lot of artists, PayPal simply seizes the money in your balance anyway to allegedly cover the damages for their user agreement violations or the cost of the investigation into their account. That's right, some artists have ended up waiting half a year for money that they need to run their business and live only to have it stolen by PayPal anyway, with as little explanation as they received for the ban in the first place. LuckFox033, after having their account banned and their funds held, decided to do something about it. They made a Twitter thread to not only detail their experience, but also to provide a platform for other artists with similar ones to share them and bring attention to the problem. This thread, as well as their update thread, will be linked in the description for you guys to go check out yourselves. But it went viral, and it received massive amounts of engagement and attention. It revealed in no uncertain terms that they were not the only artists dealing with this. There were thousands out there in the exact same position, helpless and held financially hostage by PayPal's shady business practices and policies. Luckfoxo shared those stories and even illustrated many of them. And while they did finally get their own account and money back, they have not stopped fighting for all of the artists who haven't. They've been compiling an extensive document of all of their experiences, many with plenty of detail and receipts, and have been reaching out to journalists and YouTubers all over Twitter to bring more attention to what's happening. Also starting the hashtag of Stop PayPal. I'll link the Google Doc of detailed PayPal experiences in the description as well, so that anyone interested can read all about what these artists have been dealing with. Foxo has also been working with the Indie Sellers Guild to build a webpage of resources for artists who fall victim to PayPal's wrongful bans, including information on how to get funds back, how to set up alternative payment methods, the do's and don'ts of PayPal use, how to file small claims in court, and more. All of this will be available on IndieSellersGuild.org, also linked in the description, once it's complete. But now that I've gone over a little more about what is happening, let's look more into why it's happening. Because that's naturally going to be a major point of contention if PayPal themselves won't tell us. I did reach out to PayPal for a comment on this, to which PayPal support on Twitter thoughtfully and eloquently replied, I'm really sorry to know that without reason and having people money held up to 180 days. We can only assist account holders and inform them to reach us with their email address registered to the PayPal account, and we can assist accordingly. So clearly an automated response, or at least I hope it was, because Jesus. I asked again to speak to a real person and request an interview, and was put in contact with their press team via email. And after all of that, the only response they were willing to give me was as follows. Thank you for reaching out to us. While we cannot provide specific customer account information per company policy, we review each account closely and on an individual basis, based on our long-standing acceptable use policy. Holds or other actions applied to PayPal accounts may be based on the management of risk. When this occurs, we look into the matter and take whatever action is deemed appropriate. Our dedicated customer service team is always available to help customers with their questions. And that was it. They declined the interview and refused to answer further, which they've done with every news source and member of the media that has requested a comment, including Bloomberg. And there's already so much wrong with the brief and evasive reply that they did bother to write. Like, <laughs> your dedicated customer service team is always available to help? Sorry, is this the dedicated customer service team that has, without fail, immediately responded to every artist in this position with, sorry, we're not obligated to tell you anything, we can't and won't help you? The same team that will only allow them to speak to supervisors if they spend days, weeks, or even months begging them to? The same team that regularly ignores those artists in hopes that they'll just go away? If that's the kind of dedicated help you're so proud to offer your clients, you can keep it. And then there's the bold ass claim that they closely examine every single band themselves with care and on an individual basis. I Luckfoxo was told outright that they were banned wrongfully by an AI, and they are far from the only one. 
You're telling me you thoroughly investigate every ban yourselves while thousands of artists are being banned by bots, and the hundreds who actually get their accounts back are being told they were simply banned by mistake? This coming from the same company that when Duduri Art asked them to check how they violated PayPal's terms, they told them, I would have to go through every single transaction, so no. You know what? Okay, I'm not surprised. It's the same company that also told Duduri Art, we at PayPal don't make mistakes. If you got banned, then you clearly did something wrong. Well, in the same breath, was probably probably sending out hundreds of emails reinstating accounts that their bots banned by mistake. All of that is, effectively, to say that the best explanation that I got from PayPal was the same crock of shit they've been serving to everyone who asks them why this is happening. So instead of relying on them, I looked into it myself. And what I learned can be broken down into two very different categories. Why PayPal is banning these artists, and why PayPal is holding their funds for 180 days. You would think that those would be the same, but they're not. So let's start with the first one. By now, we've effectively established that actual human PayPal staff are not responsible for these bans, but rather their AI. Obviously, the larger problem here is that whether or not an artist's livelihood and financial stability is at risk should not be in the hands of an AI to begin with, and at most, it should be used to flag their account for human review. But if we can't stop them from allowing that unbelievable carelessness, we can at least examine the AI that they're using a little more closely. We naturally can't look at that algorithm ourselves, especially since PayPal only admits to using it like 10% of the time, but we can certainly look more closely at the things that many banned accounts have in common to establish some form of educated guess at the criteria that the algorithm considers. Firstly, the one thing PayPal will tell people when they ask why they were banned is that their account was too high risk. What they mean by that is that either based on the size or frequency of your transactions, PayPal is concerned about the consequence of potential chargebacks. A chargeback is when a buyer, after the transaction is completed and finalized, requests their money back. If the chargeback is successful for the buyer, the seller will have to refund the original purchase. And if the seller has funds in their PayPal balance, this will happen automatically. But PayPal's concern lies with the risk of it happening to a seller who doesn't have funds in their balance, because in that case, it's up to PayPal to cover that cost. The seller will obviously owe them that money and be expected to pay it, but depending on their circumstances and the legitimacy of their account information, they might be able to get away with effectively abandoning the account and never paying. So if the seller has a high number of transactions or a history of very large transactions, PayPal will consider that account to be high risk because of how much they would have to cover out of pocket if the seller got a lot of chargebacks and decided to bail on their account. This is especially problematic on their end because they allow chargebacks for up to 120 days after the transaction's completion, which gives the seller plenty of time to transfer their balance to their bank account and call it quits before their buyers realize they didn't get what they paid for and file their chargebacks. It's a legitimate problem that PayPal is well within their rights to be concerned about, especially considering how many users they actually have and the prevalence of scamming online. But even so, banning any account that an AI decided could fit the criteria of being high risk is not a solution. That in mind, we can safely assume that the AI is looking primarily for activity that reflects this potential high-risk behavior. And based on both research and the comparison of banned accounts, I and others have found that the PayPal bots tend to ban accounts that have recently received more or larger transactions than their previous average, have received one or more chargebacks, or have received complaints from buyers. What this means is that as far as PayPal is concerned, if an artist's business starts taking off and they start getting more commissions or raise their commission prices, their bot is essentially liable to consider them a security risk and ban them on site. Already that's unacceptable, but that's just the criteria based on risk level. That's not all there is. PayPal's bots will also ban you based on the nature of your content. Now, most artists know that the sale of not safe for work art or commissions is banned not only on PayPal, but on most payment processing platforms. That's not new information, and it's also industry standard. But PayPal takes it one step further, because they won't just ban you for using their service to sell not safe for work content. They'll ban you if you make not safe for work content on the same website where you've integrated PayPal in any possible way, even if it's not what you're selling. Recently, they updated their user agreement to include the following, effective September 19th, 2022. If you integrate or reference PayPal services on your website, we are clarifying that PayPal may use automated technologies to assess your website to ensure compliance with the user agreement and to combat fraud. So what does this mean? It means if you so much as reference PayPal on the same website where you also have your not safe for work art posted, they can ban you. And not only that, they're openly using bots to make that assessment, which means we could easily be back in the Tumblr era of automated art policing, where a bot will decide that any image with a skin tone is explicit, no matter what's in it. 
but instead of having a post hidden and immediately approved by a human when appealed with no further consequence, artists now have to worry about having their entire PayPal account banned and their funds held, even if their site doesn't actually contain any not safe for work at all. Those are the most significant reasons that PayPal appears to be arbitrarily and wrongfully banning artists, but I'm sure there are many more false red flags that their bots are using to justify these horrendous actions that we just don't and can't know. Rather than dwelling on the fact that we're going to be indefinitely in the dark about it, let's move on to the next part, why PayPal is holding their funds for so long, or sometimes permanently seizing them altogether. Like I said, you would think that the reasons that these funds are held would be the same as the reasons for the bans in the first place. And on the surface, they seem to be. PayPal claims that this hold is to prevent loss on their end in the event of chargebacks, reinforcing their prior assertions that risk prevention is their primary concern. Although as a side point, it's interesting to note that buyers can only issue chargebacks for up to 120 days after a transaction, and PayPal is holding funds for 180 days, over a full month longer than necessary. But regardless, while that's consistently their default explanation given to everyone, they refuse to give any further information as to why the funds are being held in cases where the accounts were not banned for being wrongfully deemed high risk, but were rather banned for alleged acceptable use policy violations. And when artists press further to try to get that information, PayPal claims they have no obligation to tell anyone why their funds are being held, and have gone so far as to tell account holders that if they want any basic information about their money or their account at all, they have to get a subpoena. But upon further investigation, it turns out there's a much more likely reason that PayPal is so adamant about keeping this money for such a ridiculously long time. They're using it. As it turns out, the money held in your PayPal balance isn't actually just sitting there. PayPal is actively investing it in stocks and bonds, so that by the time you do take it out or spend it, they've already used your money to make a profit of their own. This practice is explicitly stated and defended by their user agreement, which says the following. PayPal combines your PayPal balance with the PayPal balances of other PayPal customers and invests those funds into liquid investments in accordance with state money transmitter laws. PayPal owns the interest or other earnings on those investments. So with that context in mind, there's suddenly much less mystery surrounding why they want to keep this money for as long as possible. Normally, PayPal users can use their balances at their discretion with no holds or restrictions, which would presumably make this practice of theirs a little less efficient. But if they can look at an account with a large balance and say they can't touch this for half a year with their policies thoroughly backing them up, they're going to do it because that is, as far as they're concerned, a lucrative business endeavor. For example, if they put $10,000 into a GIC, or Guaranteed Investment Certificate, which is the lowest possible risk investment, for six months, they would make anywhere from $100 to $200 just by letting that money sit there. And I'm confident that they're investing in riskier avenues, so the yield would, in all likelihood, be much higher. It benefits them in every possible way to keep your money for as long as possible. And that's assuming you ever get it back. Now let's talk about how they feel justified in defending taking it all for themselves even after the 180 day hold. In this section, there's very little to talk about for now. The permanent seizure of frozen funds is something I'll be discussing in more detail later on based on the interview I conducted. But for now, all I'll say is that PayPal's primary defense when it comes to explaining why they've stolen all of the funds that were frozen is that they're collecting damages. In many, many cases, people have reported that after waiting the 180 days to get their money back, PayPal simply told them that since they violated the acceptable use policy, the money was seized from their account, and I quote, for its liquidated damages arising from those acceptable use policies violations pursuant to the user agreement. Basically, PayPal is putting a redundant and seemingly indiscriminate dollar value on the so-called damages resulting from an AUP violation that most of the time didn't even take place, and is collecting it without anyone having the power to stop them. In the case of one artist, who I won't name because she specifically said she didn't want to be contacted by media regarding this as a result of an anxiety disorder, she waited 178 days for her money, and after barely having been able to make ends meet for six months, she was finally finally able to access her account balance, which was zero. The transaction that had wiped the balance was from PayPal and was simply labeled adjustment. And when she contacted support to get more information, she was told that all banned accounts could be held liable for $1,500 in damages per violation, while still being told that they couldn't, or wouldn't really, even tell her what that violation even was. 
She was then told to be happy that they weren't suing her for more because her balance was $778, which did not meet the maximum that they could apparently seize. As she says at the end of her segment, that $778 may have only been half of their maddeningly vague damages, but it was most of a month's income for me. And the inability to use the platform with a monopoly on quick and easy international money transfers has had a lasting effect on my business. But we're seven pages into this script and many weeks into my research for it, and I'm still not able to use any of what I've learned to offer any solutions. As it stands, PayPal is seemingly within their user agreed terms to keep abusing artists like this. And while I can tell you how to try to keep yourself safe on their platform and try to take action against them, that seems to be all I can currently do. But before I do get into keeping yourself safe while using PayPal, there is one more thing I want to bring to your attention, and it's the lawsuit. Unfortunately for PayPal, they happened to screw over enough high-profile account holders to be hit with a lawsuit as a result. Not their first one either, although the earlier instance I'm personally aware of that took place in Canada was due to hidden conversion fees, and that was settled. Still, a history of legal controversy is not something that sparks confidence in their platform, and the class action suit currently spearheaded by Lena Evans is further evidence of that. The plaintiffs involved here, just like the artists mentioned thus far, had their accounts inexplicably banned and their funds held. But in their cases, these weren't small businesses. They were big. Now, to be clear, I strongly believe that small businesses should have the same rights as they do. But in terms of social status and ability to reach media, they don't which is why the thousands of artists aren't being heard despite dealing with similar issues. Regardless, because these plaintiffs are larger, their losses are too. As it turns out, the amount that PayPal claims it can legally seize from an account is not limited to $1,500, which for anyone that's as poor as I am is already a huge amount. One person had roughly $27,000 taken from her account without reason. One had $42,000 taken from her account for dubious and vague reasons and one had $172,000 taken from his account with absolutely no explanation. As a result of this, they've partnered with the Ben Simokin Law Firm in Beverly Hills, California, and they're not letting PayPal get away with it. They're fighting them with everything they've got, and they're not fighting just for themselves. Anyone who has experienced a similar issue is encouraged to submit their experience via the intake form on their website, linked in the description. And this firm will fight for their rights to get their money back. So for any artist listening to this that has fallen victim to PayPal's awful actions, go check them out. You might have someone fighting for your rights after all, no matter how large and insurmountable your enemy here might seem to be. Anyway, I was left with a lot of questions after my initial research into this topic, largely about legal technicalities that I had no way of verifying one way or the other. So instead of just just ignoring them and moving on with the video, I instead decided to contact the Ben Simokin law firm themselves, who were very receptive and helpful, to the point that, like, if you guys have legal questions about what's going on with this, I would strongly recommend that you just ask them about it, because they care enough to answer, at least in my experience, which is not something I experienced with any other intended interviewee. Do be aware that they are very busy, though, and please be patient with them in terms of time frame. I emailed and messaged them relentlessly, like the annoying journalist in Outlast, and they were kind enough to forward my questions to their head attorney who will be voiced by me and also responded to by me since I don't have friends. I said, PayPal claims that they're completely within their rights to suspend slash limit slash ban accounts without disclosing the reason why, and that by agreeing to their policies by using their service, you're accepting the risk of your account being banned and your money being held for up to 180 days. Are they actually legally allowed to do this? They replied, The issue is not if they are allowed to do this, but rather how they go about it. Liquidated damages clauses are not illegal per se, However, they have to be in direct relationship with the loss that the other party may suffer. A random amount of $2,500 per violation does not seem to coincide with any actual damages or loss for their alleged costs to investigate. We have seen amounts in excess of $170,000 confiscated without PayPal so much as providing a report of the alleged violations and wrongdoing. I asked, is disputing their policy the basis of your suit or are you claiming damages on behalf of those affected? They replied, The basis for the suit was that PayPal is engaging in widespread conversion of people's hard-earned money with impunity. They simply cannot be allowed to continue to do this. I asked, Do they actually have the legal right to be doing what they're doing solely because their user agreement defends it? They answered, That is a question left up to interpretation. Again, a liquidated damages clause is not illegal per se, but how it is enforced is a different story. I asked, Many have claimed that not only were their accounts banned and their funds held, the remaining balances were actually seized by PayPal after the 180 days. Have you personally received any similar testimonies, and how does PayPal defend it? They said, Yes, literally thousands of people all around the world have reached out to the firm with similar stories. 
I asked. Some suggest sending a GDPR to PayPal when this happens, claiming that it forces them to return their funds and close their account within 30 days. Is this correct? They replied. I am not certain that this is correct. I asked, is the goal of your lawsuit to seek financial compensation for those affected, to seek a revision to PayPal's policies and subsequently stop this from happening, or both? They answered, the goal is to get all people all of their illegally taken money back, and to get PayPal to change their policy going forward. I said, do you have any information on the timeline of the lawsuit, i.e. a rough estimate of how long it will take to reach a resolution? They said, paypalclassaction.net is the official site with updates as to the status of the case. So, while their answers didn't end up actually answering all of my questions, largely because many of them were and still are questions without clear answers, they certainly provided much more information and insight than I had before, particularly surrounding the legal basis of their claim. Since PayPal's terms of service do seem so airtight, I had begun my research into this suit with a lot of confusion. If they do have the right to freeze these accounts based on their acceptable use policy, then how can they realistically be sued for any damages? What law are they actually breaking? This firm definitely cleared that primary concern up for me. It's not their policy that's the problem, at least legally. That's not what's breaking any kind of law. It's the way they're enforcing it, particularly the way they're using the nebulous and undefined umbrella term of damages to seize funds unlawfully. They're claiming that these amounts are owed to them based on user agreement violations, but if the amounts don't actually correspond to anything tangible monetarily, they don't have any legal right to be doing what they're doing. It was also reassuring to learn that the priority here isn't just to get people's money back, but also to persuade PayPal by any means necessary to change their policies and prevent further damage in the future. If you'd like more information on the lawsuit, I would encourage you to check out their site and follow them on social media, all linked in the description. I'm personally going to be keeping a very close eye on it to watch for updates and see how things turn out, because it feels like this might actually be a real chance to see PayPal face some genuine consequences. And after seeing what so many artists have gone through, that's something I very aggressively want to see. But even with all of that in mind, we as artists are still, for the most part, at PayPal's mercy until any kind of proper resolution is reached. So if we have to put up with their ridiculous policies and abuse of power, at least for the time being, the best we can do for now is keep ourselves informed and as safe as possible, and keep fighting for our rights. How do we do that? Well, I have some suggestions of my own that I'll get into now, but I'd first like to remind you guys once again to keep an eye out for the information page coming up soon on the Indie Sellers Guild site, because their information will likely be much more thorough as soon as it's ready. Anyway, for now, let's start with how to do everything you can to avoid being banned by PayPal under these circumstances. One thing I will mention right off the bat is that the vast majority of PayPal accounts that are banned are business accounts. To my understanding, personal PayPal accounts are either exempt from this risk or at least under much less scrutiny, potentially because a different bot is scanning them. So if you're choosing between the two for your own commissions or online store, I would at least consider that particular distinction when doing so, because going with personal rather than business might be the safer bet here. There are downsides to that, of course. You can't send invoices with a personal account, and your full legal name will be shown with every transaction, which is less than ideal for dealing with clients that are strangers on the internet, especially if you don't use your real name in association with your art and you don't want people knowing it. I would recommend looking into the pros and cons yourself to decide which option suits you better, but at least in this context, it seems like a pro to personal is that it is safer. Conversely, others advise that if you already have a business account or require one for one reason or another, try to have all of your transactions completed via invoice, not direct transfers. I have heard some people say that this prevents customers from issuing chargebacks, but that is unfortunately not true. Others, though, say that it does prevent customers from flagging your account with their feedback when they do so, which would reduce the risk of bans. I can't verify that myself, so take it with a grain of salt. But even if that's also untrue, as I mentioned before, it still allows you to add your own terms of service and have more control over the transaction. This is particularly relevant when it comes to intangible item eligibility for seller protection. What I mean is that as I discussed earlier, digital goods can technically be protected by PayPal under their seller protection program if the seller can provide proof of delivery of the item in question. By using invoices, you can specify the method of delivery, particularly by email for example, and ensure that the item's description is clearly intangible, so that you're as protected as possible if the buyer claims to have not received their physical item, and it'll be easier for you to prove that the goods were sent and received. All of this means that not only will you be vaguely safer if a client tries to scam you, that scamming attempt will be more easily proven to PayPal, which would subsequently lessen the risk of your account being flagged as high risk and potentially banned. 
Next, since PayPal appears to be banning artists based on them either having a higher number of transactions or larger transactions than normal, it could be beneficial to try to split your earnings. What I mean is that if you're accepting a lot of commissions, wherever possible, try to accept payments through alternatives instead of PayPal. Use Stripe, Square, eTransfer, etc. so that even if you are still using PayPal for clients who don't or can't use those alternatives, you're still much less likely to be setting off their bots' alarm bells this way. Another tip is to avoid having any not safe for work art, or even suggestive art, posted on any website that you have your PayPal account integrated or even referenced on. Not safe for work content cannot be sold via any major payment processor, so if that's what you're actually using PayPal to sell, I can't help you there. You're running the risk of having your account rightfully banned, and I would strongly encourage you to instead research other payment methods. But if you're only selling safe for work art, and just happen to also have not safe for work art on the same site you're selling it on, PayPal is apparently still well within their rights to ban you, so please be as cognizant of that as humanly possible. Avoiding chargebacks and refunds wherever possible is also very important, although Given how difficult that is for anyone to control, it's not particularly helpful advice. Finally, what's perhaps the most important advice that I can give you is to keep your PayPal balance empty at all times, whenever you possibly can. Because worst case scenario, if you do get wrongfully banned, maintaining an empty balance means that all you'll lose is your account not all of the money that you received using it. Before researching this video, I kept a significant amount of my funds in my balance at all times, just to have it separate from my personal funds and ready to be spent on business expenses. But the decision to sacrifice that convenience was an easy one when faced with the alternative of potentially losing it all at the discretion of a bot and the negligence and corruption of a corporation. But none of that can help you if you've already been banned and had your money frozen, so let's get into the next section, how to fight it. Unfortunately, if you've already fallen victim to this ridiculously abhorrent power abuse, there's not much you can do but keep contacting them. Don't let them shut you down or talk over you. Keep messaging them and emailing them and calling them, and don't let yourself be ignored or dismissed. Push to speak to a supervisor whenever possible. The artists that I've seen find the most success getting their accounts restored are the ones who fought back so hard and so relentlessly that management had no choice but to look into the issue themselves just to get them to shut up. It doesn't always work, but it can't hurt. I would also encourage you to reach out to both the Bensamokin Law Firm and LuckFoxo33. As the former may be able to help you get your money back, and the latter will help you share your experience and connect you with resources that could help you. Again, the information for both are in the description. Finally, you could also try sending PayPal a GDPR request. A GDPR request, or a General Data Protection Regulation request, is a relatively complicated thing in and of itself, and I'll include a basic explanation of it in the description, because I'll only actually be discussing it in terms of how it affects this particular issue, which is the tip of the iceberg, really. As the article I'll link puts it, GDPR requirements give consumers, or data subjects, the right to ask companies for information held about them. Within a month's time, companies must be able to fulfill the request. Data subject access requests force organizations to know where collected data is at all times, what information is being collected, how it's being used, by whom, and when it's being accessed. If the consumer finds an error, the organization must correct it. If the consumer opts to invoke their right to be forgotten, the company must erase their data. If the consumer doesn't like the way their personal data is being collected and used, they can object. Basically, all of that is to say that when PayPal bans an account and says that any bank or credit card information linked to your PayPal account cannot be removed, nor can it be used to create a new account, that is not actually true. And technically speaking, you as the account owner do possess the right to tell them to remove all of that information, close your account, and subsequently return your money within 30 days. It also means that, again, technically, they have to tell you what information prompted your account to be banned. I have read accounts from people who have said that this did not work for them, and as you might recall, the Ben Simokin firm's representative also said that they cannot confirm whether or not it would work. So I can't tell you for certain that it's in any way a surefire method, but it's still worth a shot, especially alongside the fight you put up against them through other correspondence. PayPal clearly doesn't care about making things right for you, but it does care about shutting you up if you're making enough noise. And even if a GDPR request isn't a confirmed method that works on its own, it is a way to make yourself even louder. 
In conclusion, PayPal is not a safe platform for people to use, much less artists, who have been historically even more victimized by their shitty business practices than other groups. The more I learn about what they do behind closed doors, the more disgusted I am by it, and the farther I want to stay away from the platform myself. But that's so hard to do, given the undeniable monopoly that they have over payment processing, and it's not like you can make money from art without processing payments. Personally, I'm going to be doing as much of my business as possible with alternative services from now on. And you using PayPal as nothing more than a backup, and I would strongly encourage you guys to do the same. Whether you're like me and just want to avoid both supporting them and risking their wrath, or you've been banned and you have to, here are some alternative platforms to consider looking into. Square, Stripe, Venmo, Cash App, Patreon, Ko-fi, Google Pay, Apple Pay, Facebook Pay, Skrill, Zelle, Western Union, Wise, Revolut, Commish.io, Payoneer, Subscribestar, and Etsy. I'm sure there are more than just those, and I'm also sure that those themselves have their share of issues. Most of them aren't even available in Canada, where I live, so I can't try them out. But it is worth researching each of them individually, because everyone has different financial needs, and what I look for in a payment processor is going to be completely different than what you do. So me sitting here and telling you which ones I prefer and use isn't going to be anywhere near as useful as you looking into it yourself. The point here is that while PayPal is the biggest and most versatile, internationally used option, they are not the only option. And no matter your circumstances, I'm confident that you can find another one instead. Regardless of what you choose to do with your money from here on out, what's most important is that we keep talking about this. That we keep standing up for the artists being taken advantage of and silenced by this corporation. That we keep making noise, and we keep pushing for better. Because this shit is not okay, and I for one have no intention of tolerating it quietly. Follow the lawsuit. Share the stories of people like LuckFoxo33 and the people whose voices they're boosting. Use the Stop PayPal hashtag and just keep fighting. Thank you for watching. Thank you to everyone who helped me get as much information for this video as possible. And I hope you all enjoyed it, or at least learned something about what's going on behind PayPal's adamantly closed doors. Special thank you as always to channel members Cafe Soleil, Joseph Solomon, Unknown Code, Abyss Reborn, Dolph, and Appa is Lucian, as well as patrons Batman, Kyle Lowe, Blue Swanson, This Is Totally My Name, Unity, Cora Fear, Jamisha Walker, and Jason Oliphant for their support. And I'll see you all in my next one.